workshop on the local government elections. Uh, the last round was in 2016, very eventful. We've seen what happened then, and now we want to see what's going to happen in the next round of local government elections, whether it's going to make a difference, whether things will be done differently, whether the dynamics of coalitions will be done perhaps better. So these are the kinds of things we're going to talk about uh, this morning. So welcome to you all. Um, uh, the, the, the workshop is live streamed on Facebook uh, and it's also recorded uh, and uh, a link will be shared with everyone later so that uh, should you wish to access any of the information presented, you will be able to do so. Uh, a lot of what we'll be talking about is covered in our various programs, the postgraduate diploma and the masters in governance. Uh, we, we examine a lot of these issues in great detail. Uh, we'll bring it out in terms of what's relevant to the local government elections in this morning's discussion. And uh, we've got a whole range of, of webinars on governance issues. And some of those issues relate to uh, the local government elections as well. So feel free to check out our YouTube, YouTube channel, our Facebook page, where we've got uh, recordings of previous webinars that may be of interest to you. So the, the way the workshop's going to work uh, this morning is my colleague, uh, Dr. Kahiso Pue, is going to start with the first uh, presentation and he'll take us through uh, aspects of local government and uh, he'll talk for about 45 minutes. And after him, I'll talk for another 45 minutes looking specifically at the processes and implications of how the local government election system works and why it's different from national and provincial elections. So without further ado, let me hand over to my colleague, Kahiso. Uh, Kahiso, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good Prof, morning, and uh, uh, good morning uh, to the uh, uh, House at Large, and uh, thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, as Prof said, my name is, I normally go by TK Power, and I'll just be going through my presentation quickly. I think uh, the main aim as, uh, the main aim of my presentation as uh, when it set it up, if we just can give you a few minutes to put it on screen quickly. Is it uh, ready? Hi, just to show everyone that I do exist and I'm not a bot. Uh, my presentation uh, will probably be up now. I I've titled my presentation, Compassing My Street Neighborhood Ward Using LEDs and IDPs. I'll explain what that is uh, just a bit later, uh, but I just, just to give a framework, uh, if we could just go to the, Next slide. Just to give a framework of my presentation, I tend to talk a lot. So uh, the reason I'm using a compass is, look, uh, it's, it's amazing how, no matter how advanced we've become, no matter how many apps we've developed, we, we still use the term uh, compass and we still also use it in, even in our gadgets, uh, everyday gadgets that we use. Uh, there's always that thing called the true north, which you can use our camp to use our campus. So I just wanted to frame it in that way, because I think there's a, as Prof will probably touch on a lot, when we speak about governance and local government, there's so much to really just, just to consider that sometimes I think we just need to slow it down a bit and just say, listen, yes, we know there's north, south, north, east, due to south and everything else, but what are the key things we could really use to compass, I think what I think is important, which is the street and the neighborhood, which you, you might be reporting on. Just the next uh, slide. The presentation is going to take five. Uh, uh, it's, got, it's got five elements to it, which I I hope to be able to really run through. It. There's just a general overview of how local government is viewed or is covered, why local government is not sexy, developing points or narrative explaining the compass potential of local government, and local economic development and ID and uh, integrated development planning, which I'll explain later on. 
And then just maybe I'm going to just leave this one to, to the house at large, bringing the power of narration to my ground level ward. Because I think when you, uh, local government as opposed to national government really is important in that it really is supposed to be speaking about what's actually happening at my ward. As in when I first leave my house, while I might leave my house in the K or Miss K of ESCOM, that's a national problem altogether. But when I leave the house, when I leave, you know, whether it's going to a school, whether it's going to work, or whether it's, it's just your hustle or covering, that's where you meet local government. You cannot escape it. You might not know who your mayor is, but you, you uh, cannot escape what they, what they do or don't do. Now, uh, if we could just go to the next one. I, I'm just gonna just use uh, narratives uh, just to explain how I see local government is usually being covered. Usually, whether it's on television or in the media, there will be a quote from this organization named Selga. Now, do most South Africans know what Selga does or doesn't do? Look, sometimes we know them. They're the guys that seem to come in to almost put out the fires when things are going wrong in local government. Uh, next picture. But over the years, I mean, COVID notwithstanding, what we've come to understand about our gov how local government is covered is protest. We then there, I think the narrative is always the same that there is a problem of local de local government delivery, and then there is a protest, and then what tends to happen is the news goes to what has the Auditor General said of South Africa. Now we've got a new Auditor General. Maybe just to give uh, the school a plug, the new Auditor General will be, I believe, next week hosting or being hosted by the School of Government. So we invite all of you just to come to listen what maybe her vision is for the institution and how it's going to be working. But what tends to happen then is that we. We hear from the Auditor General, we all go through the reports and obviously things, big words come out when you go through the Auditor General reports, fruitless expenditure and the like. Then the questions go to COCTA, which is a Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, which I don't think everyone really knows their emblem. We just know them as COCTA. But, but I think to maybe people's credit, we all, we've come to also know who is the Minister of Cocktail these days, which is uh, Dr. Nkosazana Damini Zuma, but I think she's probably got more prominence due to the fact that we've kind of seen the power of Cocktail being extended in these uh, times of COVID. And then I think we then go to the narration, which is always unauthorized expenditure, ir irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure. And sometimes a missed narrative seems to form when if we don't understand the jargon, it's so easy to say, oh no, all these things just mean that there's corruption, which might be true, but sometimes it could just simply mean that the municipality doesn't have the requisite skills to actually use the budget. And what they've rather done is, rather than actually do their job, they've just chosen to say, listen, we're not doing anything. Forgetting that, look, the way our uh, budget works in South Africa is that if you don't use it, government, national government and treasury assumes that, listen, you don't need that money. And it basically gets taken, gets taken away from you. So this is how I view, and maybe you, you, guys, you guys who are in the room can basically tell me if one has painted a wrong picture of, what, of how local government is pictured. Now, if we're to go to the next slide, there's, there's a question I, I pose to you guys, which is to say, obviously coming closer to the elections, we, we always get that, but is, but is this the sum total of local government? Obviously, the obvious answer is no. And the reason is if you actually go to the constitution of ch chapter seven, of local government, and we're just gonna spend some time on this, particularly section 151, 152, and 153, uh, is when you actually read how local government is conceptualized, I, I make the argument to you that when this is read in this proper context, one can actually make the argument that the most important sphere of government, notwithstanding what national government does, is actually local government. As I said, when you leave your house, you meet local government for it's for the better or for the worse. But I just want to go through section 151 quickly, status of municipality, and it's particularly subsection three, which is a municipality has a right to govern on its own initiatives, the local government affairs of its community subject to national provincial legislation, which sort of says if you had to just look at it in, in, in terms of a narrative, in terms of the narrative I'm trying to develop, it says that listen. This entity or this fear of government has actually been given quite an immense lot of power. A power in the sense that it either shows you the positive side of government or it shows you the negative side of government. And it's actually been empowered to such degrees that if you go to section 152, the objectives of local government, you'll see that it's supposed to provide democratic accountable government for local communities, i.e. wards, 
and your, your participation as just an average citizen. It's supposed to ensure the provision of services to communities in a sustainable manner. Now, obviously it takes different forms. Not all municipalities have the same amount of power, but at, at, look at, at its, let's say maybe at a superficial level, the issues of picking up waste and removal, the issues of ensuring that you know, the pieces bulk infrastructure has been accounted for. Uh, I come from a community in the VAR where we've seen the other side of how this works, where over time we've seen a degradation of how local government is not actually attending to issues such as provision of services. And I think these are the important ones, which I think are almost overlooked, namely sections uh, 1C, which is promote social and economic development, promote safe and healthy environment, to encourage the involvement of community and organizations in the matters of local government, and the reason I say these are important is because uh, sometimes there is a argument which says that, listen, um, it would seem as though in democracy in South Africa, once we put our X to the, once we put our X to the table, to, to, the, to the ballot box, our responsibilities end there. And I think now a narrative is saying that, listen, we need more. Hence, you, you get initiatives which say, listen, I really believe now is the time to start to say, I want to, I want to actually vote for my local MP. I want to be more involved in how things are going. But what people tend to forget is this is actually happening at local government level. If you talk about proportional representation and the like of profit, we'll probably touch on a bit later on. But what I, I'm trying to get to is to say there's a lot of objectives of local government which actually have the citizen at heart. Most importantly, local government is supposed to actually get the citizens into this process. And I, I think this is where maybe one of the failings has been that while all this is great on paper, it's not being seen out. And in the context of today's, uh, I, I think in today's workshop, I think this is maybe the issues which are a bit underreported, which is to say that as citizens and local government is actually supposed to create the space where you can actually, you don't have to wait for some large uh, meeting in terms of the, where they meet in the chambers, but they're actually supposed to come to you and actually make the space for you to say, listen, this is what is happening in relation to social development. This is what's happening in relation to economic development. And I, I'd make the argument and I put it to you that unfortunately, this is actually not the case. And most times, everything I've just discussed here tends to really not exist. Now, one might say maybe citizens are not active, or another counter argument say that local government would prefer that you know citizens don't actually ask them any questions. But I think in the context of uh, today's workshop, maybe the question should be who should be bridging, uh, bridging this knowledge to to ensuring that one municipalities actually provide the local platforms. Two citizens are empowered to say, listen, you need to actually come and account to me and explain to me what are you promoting in terms of social and economic development. And I think this is where the media should be looking towards. But as I'll go later on. Uh, we'll probably debate why this and this is not this is not happening. But I'll just end with I want to just go to section one five three, development duties of municipalities. It says a municipality must uh, must it puts a structure and manage its administration, budgeting, planning processes. Now this is important in the context of how, how you view municipalities vis-a-vis -vis national government. You'll find that this is actually one of the few times in the constitution where it's, it's, it's a very direct uh, order from the constitution to say, listen, as a municipality, it, you need to put your, basically you need to put your affairs of the house in such a way that you actually include communities. Meaning on issues of administration, budgeting, planning processes, you actually need to get the community involved in this and they need to understand. Now, as I've been saying, this is actually not happening to the level we, we have seen. And I'll put the argument further on to say the reason why local government, as in inverted commas, is such a mess is because I think local government municipalities have actually been allowed to get away with a bit of murder in that communities have not really been taught well to say, listen, these are the structures you need to use to hold them accountable. If we could just go to the next slide. And it basically comes to this why local government is not sexy. Now, I went to Google and I tried to type sexy, uh, but because we're in a school of governance and we're at the Vits University of the Witwatersrand and I don't want to be slapped with the sexual harassment uh, suit, I, the pictures that came on Google, I tended to ignore and I just used these ones. So when I typed in sexy car, this is what came up. I'm not a car fundi, I can't tell you what, what this car is. I just know that it has a very nice and a sleek shape to it. If we go go to the next picture. And then obviously it would seem as though sexy is very synonymous with cars. Uh, 
I know this is a Bentley because I think my wife told me that she's very good with cars. And believe it or not, uh, Kaiser Chiefs came up in, in the word sexy when you're looking at football. Uh, this, is a, this is a truth. I'm not joking. And if we go to the next picture. Now, I think one of the reasons why local government is not sexy is that, let's be honest, people and maybe even the news media would rather prefer to, to narrate the story about the EFF, the DA at a macro picture, who their national leaders are, what they do, as opposed to, you know, what is actually happening in War 61 in Van der Bale Park in the City Bank district of Mfuleni, or what's happening in Tata? You know, those questions are not sexy. Hence the term, let's be honest, local government is not sexy. What would preoccupy people's minds is questions of which faction is winning, which faction is not winning. Regardless of whether we're in a government, we're in a local government election year cycle, the obsession will be what is sexy? Well, is the RET winning? Is a new dawn faction winning? And then somewhere there in the next picture, you'll see the only time maybe it becomes sexy is if we see a personality who comes to the fore, like we did in the last local government elections, the former mayor of uh, the city of Johannesburg, Mr. Herman Mashaba, or as we did in the previous elections, and the next picture you'll see, we either have Mr. Solim Simang, I couldn't get an updated picture of Mr. Solim Simang because the latest pictures kind of have him looking a bit, um, I think what's a kind way to use, He's looking a bit beaten up by politics. I'll just leave it at that. Or if you have someone like uh, Mr. Musi Maimani. So that, that's why, you know, local government becomes a bit boring in the sense that, you know, personalities, uh, apologies about that, Tell it, personalities drive politics. We cannot get away from that. And if, we, if people don't find the personalities involved in local government to be sexy, the media, and I think maybe the, Population at large will go back to what they term to be sexy. Um, next slide. Is this view wrong? Well, I, I in looking around, I came across this uh, article from 2007 titled Sleeping with the Enemy, Local Government and the Media. And I think the, the, the person or this, uh, who wrote this piece actually kind of captures it correctly. I'll just read the top part, but maybe for a minute or so, I'll just ask everybody just to read this long quote and maybe in the chat function, tell me whether this they believe is true, if they could just use a T or if it's a false, or if it's a false narration. But the, the subtitle kind of goes, it's time that municipal spin doctors confronted the hard truth that local government is not a sexy topic across the newsrooms of the nation. Now, I don't work in the newsroom. I just am a consumer of the newsroom and probably I'll just leave it to you guys to just judge whether it's a true statement or not, but maybe I'll just give a minute or two to just allow you guys to just read this long, this rather long quote. And in the chat function, if you can simply, if you agree that look, the statement is actually the truth, just put a T. If you think it's false, just put an F and, I, and I'll just probably give you two minutes or so just to go over it uh, before I go to the next slide. All right, I see, uh, uh, sorry, is it Laura or Laura? Apologies of that, it's uh, the German tongue I have, it's Laura, Laura. Look, it says journalists on the, on the municipal beat, whether working for community or commercial media face a daily challenge of covering local government in issues in a manner that will not have readers nodding off. I won't read the, the, all of it, but I think it, it kind of, uh, from what I've come across in the literature, and also just having spoken to people generally, this tends to be the viewpoint that, listen, Local government's not sexy. And the reason being that if you really look at it, who wants to cover what the mayor is doing in a far-flung place? It doesn't have factions, it doesn't have cabals. It's actually quite boring. 
Uh, that's how it goes. If we could just go to the next slide. Now, I think based on that, uh, you as a media, uh, media professions actually going forward have a, it's almost like a, a strange task at hand. Now, I think if we all admit, and I think generally we are of the view that uh, local government is not sexy, it's either we can do basically one or four things. One, we can continue with the with a narrative which says that, well, yeah, maybe local government is for those people who really care, like those people that live in Cape Town. There's a first picture which show you that's the current mayor, uh, Mr. Dan Plato. Or what sometimes tends to happen is people might try to get a two for one, you know, the media two for one, which is Mr. Andile Masina. Yes, he's the mayor of Ekuruleni, but he's also quite a powerful uh, individual within the ANC. So we'll cover his municipality with the hope that he'll say something that relates to issues of factions. Or you could do three, which I think most people, it's important, but I think most people argue that, listen, this is not really what we want to cover, which is you just give the, you just give the narrative and the, and, you know, and the quantitative, which is to say over the next three years, referred to as the medium term expenditure framework, 1 billion, basically just given numbers to say, this is local government in numbers. What those numbers mean for a person who, who, who lives in maybe in Soweto, who, who lives in Ekwama, not really that important, but look, we've done our part. Or we can continue the narrative of, look, there's a new auditor general. Maybe she might do something different in relation to the powers she's been given. Or what I suspect is going to become quite a developing narrative going forward, which is we're going to be hearing a lot about this thing called the district development model, which has been launched by within the presidency. And it's, it's, a, it's assumed that this is going to be the 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 tool to reju reju rejuvenate local government uh, just the next slide uh, the previous one if we uh, sort of like if you could go to the uh, the the word document i i emailed alongside the slide what this document will do is i'm proposing to you uh to, to you as members of the media that i think what one local government needs to be covered, we, we have all have to make an admission that local government needs to be covered in a very different way. And it doesn't have to be, I think, a boring narrative, as I think as we've, we've gone through. Because if you actually look at IDPs, and if you look at uh, local economic development, I think there's actually enough in it to be quote unquote sexy. Now, uh, just waiting for it to come up. Uh, and within it, uh, I'm just going to go through a few things I've picked up, which I think if we started covering news in, in local government in this way, I think you'd find that the, the narrative would change. It would be sexy. I think the term they use is, is ed, edutainment, which is education mixed with entertainment, in the sense that if you look at what IDPs are, which is simply integrated development plan, uh, I've highlighted the key things. There's a super plan in an area that gives an overall framework for development. It should take into account the existing conditions, problems, resource available for development. It must set a framework for how land should be used, what infrastructure and services are needed, and how the environment should be protected. I think that alone is important. I think usually IDPs, the big plan starts at the beginning of a, of a term of, a, of, a, of any administration, which is to say, this is our five-year plan. In this five-year plan, this is what we aim to do. And every year they report in, in the form of many IDPs reports what they've been doing. Within it, they cover things such as infrastructure, the economy of, a, of the area, you know, how lights are working, the safety of the area. And I think there's enough in IDPs, if they were properly reported within the news, to, to the local communities to say, listen, in a way, we're taking the big narrative, which normally goes when we look at national government and treasury and everything involved in it, and you're actually miniaturizing to say, hey, when I'm Amdlamini, who's living go like go 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 Newman, go Everton. This is what the mayor or the mayor and the let's say the leadership of your municipality are stating that they're going to do in the next five years. And I think if we covered it in that way, it, it would become a one, it, it becomes something more real to communities because communities now can be able to say, oh, okay, no, listen, you know what? In the big plan, it was stated that my street in the next five years is slated to get proper street lights for safety. We're supposed to get actual, we're actually supposed to ensure that issues such as bylaws are actually respected, which is to say, are things being picked up? 
Uh, is the music in line? As in, obviously, look, we all enjoy music, but we all don't want your music at one or two o'clock in the morning. So you start to put those little things into, you can start picking it up. And I think if the media were to actually start reporting local government, not as this big whale, but as rather this thing which has smaller parts called IDPs for each and every region of South Africa and each and every municipality, I think it would make a better narration. Right? If we could just go down on the IDP thing. Why is it necessary to do an IDP? Well, the six reasons that are given, if we could just go down. First one, effective use of scarce resources. It helps speed up, serve, speed up delivery. It helps attract additional funds, strengthens democracy, helps to overcome the legacy of profit, promotes coordination. I'm just gonna pick on two of these, issues of scarce resources and the issues of it helps attract additional funds. By scarce resources and IDPs are designed in such a way that they, you need to, as a, as a local government entity, you need to account for how you're using land and space. As you may well know over the last, one well, myself, the last 10 years, we've seen this phenomenon called selling where councillors are accused, and I can only use the word accused, of selling houses to, to local, to, to people. And this ends up basically allowing mushrooming for informal settlements to happen. Now, it's great to report it when it's happened, and it's great to hold those, uh, those councillors accountable. But I think the proper place we would have started would be to actually have ascertained what is the land use in the area? And if there is vacant land, why is that the case? Because part of the IDP and government is mostly harsh on this to say, you need to account for why you're not using land. So I'm putting it to you, rather than waiting for to hearing about land invasions, I think the proper place to actually have started is an IDP to actually ascertain why does this a city, and I'm just making a fictitious example, why does the uh, Mukhale city have such a high level of, of people invading land? Now, yes, councillors can play a part, but I think a better way to put it is to say, let's actually look at what the IDP of Mukhale city said and how this has been developing over time and why this is the case. And three, it attracts additional funds. Now, this is one of the ways you, you can actually keep your local government accountable to say, listen, why are you not actually attracting the private sector into our areas? Because the job of a mayor and the job of a lot of these committees, is, that's actually primarily what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be speaking to business. And IDPs actually give you a narration and plans as to are they, are they not doing this? It, if we can go down a bit, what is the ID, IDP process? Before starting an IDP process, and I'll just maybe dwell on this a bit, is to say, look, the whole IDP, IDP process, yes, it's, it's taken on by local government authorities and the IDP unit, but in it, they're actually supposed to explain the following. What's the structure and the managing of the process? Number two, and I think this is maybe important, most important, how the public, how the public can participate in structures that will be created in ensuring participation. And I think this is probably one of the most underreported parts of IDPs in local government in South Africa, because it basically is saying by law, you as a as local government, city of Joburg or Buffalo City, cannot simply say, listen, I'm creating this IDP, it's my great plan, and you as local government people will find me along the way. By law, they're actually supposed to explain when and how can people get, get involved. Things such as explaining time schedules for planning processes, who is responsible for what and how will this be monitored. And I think this is where maybe if one might make a critique of the media is that we don't see enough of these stories to advertise when IDPs are coming out. If anything, you normally, if you pick up even community or if you listen to community radio station, you'll hear that there is a IDP or, or mini in Bezo of the state of the local government. That really is not that important. What should be important in the narration is when and how and who have you invited in this IDP process? And it actually goes to the granular level where you're actually supposed to have ward committees, which is basically mini parliaments, which is supposed to be made up of community members on that street. And this is, I find, one of the great weaknesses in reporting local government or, or local government as a whole, that there's not enough structures, there's not enough communication to explain how do you actually get people to be involved in these processes? Because I put a hypothesis to you that if, this was the case if most media houses, especially lo local news outlets and the like, were to actually make it a point of saying, listen, here's the IDP of the city of Joburg. It, it was explained when they went to this community in Joburg or Lenencia that this is going to be the processes. The person who explained it was X and Y, they gave the plan. And this is how the, how the community responded. 
I think it will give the community that confidence to be able to start saying, one, the media has explained to us what our role is and what constitutionally we're allowed to do in these structures and what we're not allowed to do. And we're finding that we can actually start questioning people. Because unfortunately, what has tended to happen with ID, IDP process is that it's a top-down process. Local government or any municipality creates an IDP. They create some lunch. They invite some media personalities to get there. They say, this is what we are doing. And then the community just sits there silently being fed. And they're not explained to say when they're going to actually play a part. Uh, Rato, if you can go straight to the top to the LED section. And uh, LED, I think, is one of those very underreported things in, 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 in local government, in the sense that I give a definition of what LED is. Basically, it's basically a housing economy of that very same municipal area working. What's the businesses involved? Our business is being taken care of. And when we say business, it's not simply saying, look, you're looking at your big companies. It's actually saying, if you find that, you, well, you're supposed to as a municipality, you're supposed to say, listen, if I find that a lot of the businesses that are working in my area are informal, am I actually able to give them the necessary services? I think one of the things which I've seen developed over time is taxi ranks, where some local governments or some municipalities that are a bit smarter they actually do go in and try to make sure that, you know, taxi ranks become areas where commerce is happening. Now, whether this has been a success or not, I, I would put it that, look, if you've visited any taxi rank, never, look, I don't think they're really up to scratch. I think it's great to try and make them centers of the economy, but I think there's a heck of a lot more work that needs to go into this. Uh, Rato, if we can go down. Now, uh, uh, the LED provides support in the following way. Now, if an LED plan of a municipality is working properly, the end result, I'm just gonna, for the purposes of time, I'm just gonna say, it, you, you're supposed to find that when an, and an LED plan works properly, the, let's say the plans of whoever the mayor is or whoever the municipal leadership is, it's actually supposed to filter all the way up to local government, uh, all the way up to national government. Reason being, that's when they can now start doing pricing, or they're supposed to do pricing of what projects are. But if you go to the, uh, to the next section, Rato. I just go down again. Okay, so it's so there. Okay, no, I'll, I'll just stop there. What, I'm, oh, sorry, is it me or someone else? Okay, so the, what, what you tend to find is, is happened, and this is a document, is when it comes to LED, most local governments don't actually know how LED is supposed to work. There's this whole tussle between who is supposed to actually create the economy. Is it the local government entity known as a municipality? Is it provincial government or is it national government? And I put it to you that one of the main reasons this, this debate is happening is there's not enough reporting. Oh, no, no, wrong lift. I'm looking for this one, R2. Uh, sorry, can you mute yourself if you... Yes. Upstairs? Yes. Oh, it's only pointing down, I thought. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, would you mind muting yourself? All right, I'll continue. Uh, as I said, uh, you tend to find that what's actually happening is because there's not a clear... I put a direction from the side of a local government as to how LED is supposed to work. It sort of becomes something where people say, oh yeah, there's such a thing as LED and it becomes such as, people view it as such a specialized field in South Africa that only a few people know about it. And I put it, it's because there's not been enough pressure from the local, let's say from uh, local media to explain that, listen, uh, we as people who actually live in this area actually got a right to know what are the plans that are coming in, in relations to economic development? And secondly, why is it that when I see certain areas developing, businesses are doing well there and it's not happening here? Now, I, 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 I think we can all agree that, listen, South Africa's development is very unequal due to apartheid spatial planning. But what is missing is, a, is that narrative which says, okay, listen, when you go into and you're campaigning in local government, who actually asks these local government, these political parties, what is your LED plan? Don't tell me your national plan. Don't tell me nationalization without compensation or whatever the narrative is of the day. Don't tell me that. 
simply tell me, I live here, go Rustenburg. When the mines finish, because they will finish one day, what, what is the plan for this area? Most importantly, when you've been working with mining companies, why does it seem as though the only thing you ever ask from mining companies is to build a road? What about the, the ecosystem of the area as a whole? And I think this is, an, this is where the media, I think, has kind of done South Africa a bit of a disservice in that they're not actually reporting what LED is, and, that, and they're not actually reading through the programs. Now, it, it could, I know there's been a lot of budget cuts within the media newsrooms, but I think this is where media, media rooms linked with universities or even schools of governments can actually come together where we can actually say, listen, as a media, we're finding that there's this concept called LED, there's this thing called IDP, the city has put it out there. When you read it as an expert, what do you think? And I think we need to create those forums where we can actually start deciphering a lot of the mystery. That should not be a mystery when it comes to issues such as LED and IDPs. And I believe that if we really could put a holistic new spin and spin in the positive, not spin doctrine, spin in the positive about, listen, let's actually start looking at making narrations or narratives around as I said, bringing the, the power of narration of my ground level ward, which is to start saying, let's report local government, not as a, and I, I guess, maybe, look, it's an English term, I didn't invent it, not as an ugly stepsister, as, an, as, a, as a brutal brother-in-law, or as, as, a, as a brutal brother, stepbrother, but as something which is actually very pertinent to how development is supposed to happen in South Africa. Because I think once we make local government sexy by, as, I put in, as I'm putting it to you, identifying LEDs and IDPs as ways we can hold local government to account, as ways we can actually explain the narrative of why certain areas are developing or not. I think it'll make the populace smarter to understand and not to be duped by the narrative that, listen, development only happens at national government. Don't get me wrong, there is a place for national government and it's very, very important and we should never stop covering it. But I think going forward into the future, we need to start expending the same energy we do on national government as we do for local government. Because when we do that, using the parameters of LED and IDP, I think people will start to, be, will start to find expressions and ways of where they fit into the narration of development in South Africa, which is supposed to start at the local government and eventually cascade onto national government. And with that, that is my presentation and I hope it was informative and I'm more than happy to take questions going forward. Thanks, TK. Um, nice overview of the technical issues and all the administrative structures in local government, especially uh, LED and how all of that works. Um, so thanks for that. And we'll take questions uh, at the end of the presentations, which means that it's now my turn to present uh, in this webinar. And before I put my PowerPoint up, uh, just to introduce what I'm going to talk about with a case study, an example to get us thinking. I'm sure that you've all read in the media, social media in particular, about the city of Johannesburg's 120 days of accelerated service delivery. And you've, you've, you've asked questions about that. Why? suddenly 120 days of accelerated service delivery. And you've thought a bit about that and you've formulated some hypotheses as to why they're doing that. And then you start to look at where this service delivery is happening. And you see two key areas where this 120 days of accelerated service delivery is happening. Uh, and you'll see that it's uh, El Dorado Park, and you'll see that it's Lanasia. So the moment you see that is the moment you need to start to ask a whole range of other questions. Why the focus in those areas? And then when you look at by-election results in between 2016 and 2021, you see that the DA has lost significant support and smaller parties have won significant support. Al Jamaa in uh, Leneza and the Patriotic Alliance in El Dorado Park. So small parties starting to win wards and garner support in those areas. 
And now we're in the realm of local government elections, exactly this kind of issue. So I want to talk about the process of local government elections. I want to talk about what the significance is and why they matter. Uh, and let me run through my presentation. And then finally, we'll take questions on both uh, presentations. So I'm busy sharing it and it should be on your screens now. Um, and there you have it. You can see my presentation. So let's start off by talking about how local government elections work. And I'm going to focus my presentation around the electoral process. Local government elections are very different to national and provincial elections, which we've had uh, a few years back. And in local, uh, national and provincial, you stand in a queue and you get two ballots, a ballot for national and a ballot for provincial. You tick where you wish to tick, you put them in a box and out you go. And then the votes determine the number of party representatives in provincial le legislatures and in national parliament. It's a straightforward, simple proportional represent representation system. At local government level, it's very, very different. Very, very different. At local government level, we have a mixed system. Municipalities are divided into wards and you have ward party competitions uh, independents can stand at local level, not at national and provincial yet. The constitution has to be amended to accommodate that in some way. But at local level, you can have ward competitions with independents and political parties. And you also have a proportional representation PR component. So there are two ways councillors get elected into your local government council. So at ward level, it's first past the post. You've got a number of parties competing through their candidates. You could even have independent candidates. And the person who becomes the councillor is the one who gets the highest number of votes. First past the post. So whoever gets the most votes in that ward wins the ward. And that's pretty straightforward. And the idea here is to make sure that your councillor is accountable and responsive to the needs of residents in that particular geographic area. So you want to focus accountability to street level issues in a part of the municipality. And the ward councillor has to respond to complaints issues, electricity failures, potholes, water blockages, sewage uh, blockages, all of that um, in terms of localizing uh, accountability directly. At the PR level, it starts to get more complicated because you allocate seats in your municipality, in the council, in terms of the number of votes and the proportion of votes that the parties get. Independents can't stand as PR uh, councillors. So when you calculate PR, you exclude uh, independents. So the way municipal councils work is that it's half ward, half PR. Now that's really, really, really significant. Half the seats are ward, half the seats are PR. Now this has massive implications in terms of how parties mobilize and campaign at local government level, very different to national and provincial level. Now there's a formula for the proportional representation allocation that's pretty clear in terms of wards. Those parties that win the wards have their seats in council much less clear in terms of the PR allocation. It's complicated, it's really important, and there's significant politics around this. And that's why as uh, journalists covering local government, one has to look at this PR allocation. 
So it's all very exciting stuff, this, because uh, parties will compete to flip wards. Uh, ANC losing a ward to the DA or the I IFP, etc. Very exciting. Uh, that's not the major way where councils are won or lost. Councils are won or lost in terms of the allocation of the PR component, the other 50% of council seats. So there's a complicated formula. It's all on the IEC website, and I've directed you to the URL where you can find this. And it sets out the process for ward councillor election and the process for PR councillor election. It's all terribly complicated. Uh, let me run through it very briefly and quickly. Uh, for the PR component, you've got a number of cuts. The first cut is you look at the percentage that parties get excluding independents. And you work out the number of votes for a PR seat. And you allocate parties those seats in terms of that cut. The, you then look at the fractions. You add up all the fractions. So party A got 23.4%, party P got 35.6%, party C got 36.2%. You add up the 0 0.2, the 0 0.6, et cetera, and you allocate seats in accordance with those fractions. And then you'll still have a percentage of votes outstanding based on that calculation. And that will be the third cut. And then you will look at small parties to see whether they meet a threshold to get representation. So the whole idea of these three cuts in terms of uh, PR councillor allocation is to ensure that uh, there's fair representation, but also to ensure that smaller parties are represented in town councils. So you want to ensure that there's a diversity of representation in your town councils. If it was simply a ward contest, the big parties would dominate councils. But because you've got the PR component with the three cuts, you end up in with a situation, which is a good thing, I think, that smaller parties are empowered to be in the councils. So this is the formula. This is how it works. Uh, and uh, follow this closely. It's very contentious, very contested, and you'll see why uh, as I go through some of the, the issues in a moment. So why does all of this matter? Why is local government elections important? Uh, what is this whole thing about PR and ward? So, it tells us a lot, uh, the, the dual system, the mixed system, PR and ward, it tells us a lot about the concentrated support that parties have. If you don't have consolidated support in a ward, in a geographic area, you can still be represented in council in terms of PR seats. And that's the number of votes you get in a municipality as a whole in terms of that formula. And that enables diversity of political party representation in councils. So you can have PR seats without winning wards. And uh, the EFF is a good example of this at the moment. We wait to see whether they can win wards uh, in the forthcoming uh, local government elections. So that's the issue there with the PR component. It, it, it allows you to get into council without having concentrated support in a particular part of the municipality. Now, what this means is that it's not just about winning wards. Parties mustn't just win their wards with a simple majority in terms of first past the post. The really important issue here is voter turnout. And this is what uh, uh, you, you as journalists might consider covering 
when you when you go out and 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 look at voting stations how long are the queues in areas that gives you a sense of turnout why is this turnout important it's important because if you win your ward with a really high voter turnout for your party you get the additional advantage of pr percentages so you don't just want to win your wards, you want to win your wards with a margin of 20, 30, 40% compared to your closest rivals, because that gives you a bump in terms of the PR allocation. So this is the politics of turnout. It's not enough to just win by a couple of votes. You've got to win by a couple of thousand votes to get uh, the, the PR advantage in your, in your wards. So as I've said, uh, the mixed system has advantages, smaller parties, diversity, a plurality of representation, and that's really, really, really important. It matters significantly because if you have a majority party in council, which is PR seats plus ward seats, that majority party elects the speaker and the speaker controls the proceedings of council, the interpretation of the rules, the making of bylaws, the passing of business plans, uh, building plans, uh, business licenses, demarcating and rezoning land, really important issues that come up in council. So the majority party, if there is one, elects a speaker the majority party then elects the mayor and uh, the MACO, the mayoral committee flows from the election of the mayor. Now, this is all really important because you're talking now about political oversight of administration, the legislature in council performing oversight functions over the executive and the line function departments. So the election at local government level matters in terms of holding your executive leadership and the administration, the bureaucracy to account in terms of their performance. And we'll come back to that in a moment. If you don't have a majority party, you've got the dynamics of coalition local governments. And in South Africa, we've now got some experience of this in the metros, Nelson Mandela Bay, Chwane, uh, Johannesburg, and some years back, uh, Cape Town. And I'll talk more about coalition governments shortly. So things to look out for when you're covering uh, local government elections, perhaps uh, some ideas. For Voice of Its uh, people, that's the target area, Johannesburg. And some of the big questions in Johannesburg uh, are, can the ANC win 2021 outright or return through a coalition? A coalition requiring fewer partners. Uh, big issue there in terms of uh, the ANC coming, coming back, uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. The other side of the coin is, can the DA form a cohesive coalition this time round? So if there's no majority, can the DA find coalition partners that will enable a stable coalition? We have uh, experience in Johannesburg of unstable coalitions resulting in minority governments a minority government resulting in a new party coming in a year or two back because of the instability of that coalition. So coalitions depend on smaller parties and the EFF has played the role of queen maker through its PR seats in Johannesburg, in Chwane, Will it have more influence in other municipalities, especially in Northwest, in Limpopo, in Free State, and uh, maybe even in Pumalanga? Uh, EFF is on a roll in 
parts of uh, KZN, especially in Etequini. So to look out for smaller parties coming in as queen makers uh, in coalition politics, should they not be a majority party. So in Johannesburg, Alexandra, um, very strong pockets of EFF support, but not enough in 2016 to win wards. Can they win wards this time around? Very important question, because winning a ward shows that you've got concentrated support as opposed to dispersed support, which gives you representation through numbers <clears throat> rather than through geographic concentration. Very important to watch out for the Patriotic Alliance, as I mentioned in my introduction, Eldorado Park, uh, taking votes from colored communities away from the DA. We've seen that in by-elections. <clears throat> What's the significance of that 2021? Uh, will it uh, stop? Will it continue? Will it speed up? How will that change the power balance in terms of the council if the DA loses votes to these smaller parties, will those smaller parties then form coalitions or alliances with other parties to create a new coalition government? That's the significance of all of this. Very important in Lanasia, Al Jamaa taking votes from the DA in the Indian communities. Uh, and, and we've seen shifts there in terms of wards and the same issue there in terms of the Patriotic Alliance in Eldorado Park. Small parties are now starting to become quite powerful in terms of their one or two ward seats, but also their PR seats in terms of fitting into and enabling and contributing to and using coalitions to further their uh, policy agendas. So we need to watch the IFP in many municipalities. We need to watch the Africa Independent Congress, especially in Kululeni. Uh, they played a crucial role in enabling a coalition with the ANC to come into office, and it's been a very stable coalition ever since. So these are some of the things to look out for as uh, 2021 LGE unfolds. For the bigger parties, what are the things that might want to be of interest to journalists watching and covering uh, the, the, the elections? For the DA, they, they've got to repeat their turnout in amongst white suburban voters in 2016. And that was a remarkable achievement then because when you look at the wards where they won those wards, they won those wards with 65 to 90% uh, turnouts with majorities that were in the many, many thousands. So what that showed us in 2016 is that winning your wards gave you one seat in council, but winning those wards with high turnouts with strong majorities gave you a double bounce in terms of the PR allocations. And that's why the, the, the DA became so powerful in many municipalities uh, around the country in the councils is because of that high turnout in particular wards. So they, they, they need to watch that and we need to, to keep an eye on that to see uh, if that continues. The by-elections that have occurred between 2016 and now um, suggest that the DA is going to have difficulty to repeat that success. Um, so, so we need to watch that to see what the actual turnouts are. And that's why watching the queues at voting stations in key kind of um, indicator wards in municipalities can give you a sense of what the turnout is going to be. The other issue for the DA, can they hold on to their small but not insignificant gains in Soweto? So 
people tended to ignore the DA's performance in Soweto 2016. But they were getting 12%. They were getting 16% in some wards. Sounds insignificant, but they were major gains compared to where they stood um, compared to 2011. Now, can they hold those gains? Can they increase those gains? Because if they lose those gains in Soweto in particular, who's going to win those votes? Are those voters going to vote? Are they going to stay away? Really important issues there in terms of the PR allocation. So the ANC won those wards, but they didn't win them with the comfortable majorities that they'd had in the past. Uh, the DA was showing signs of growth. Can that continue? And we'll talk more about that towards the end. What are the challenges? What are the issues for the ANC? Can they hold their traditional wards in Soweto and Alexandra, especially with EFF growth, growth in Alexandra? I'm talking specifically here to just focus the discussion around Johannesburg. Can they get the turn up, turnout to increase significantly? The turnout in 2016 was very poor and they, they held their wards, but they lost PR seats. Hence the ANC dropping to uh, behind uh, the 50 plus one in council, hence coalition governments in Johannesburg and other municipalities. Now, part of the decline in ANC support was linked to the previous uh, national leadership of the ANC. There's now a new leadership, there's a new dawn, there's the, the cleanup. Is this going to have a positive impact for the ANC in terms of getting turnout to be higher so that they win those Soweto and Alex wards with higher margins to get more of the PR seats? That's really the big challenge that the ANC faces. It's unlikely they're going, they're going to lose wards, but it's not just winning wards, as I said earlier. You've got to win wards with much, much more support. It's all about the PR allocation. The things to watch out for in terms of the EFF, can they win wards in Rustenburg, in Northwest? They've shown potential in Northwest to concentrate support not just win PR seats, as I said earlier in Alexander, and other key wards around the country, especially in KZN, where the EFF is showing quite exceptional growth uh, in Etiquini. So the issue here is clustered versus dis dispersed support. Uh, can the EFF break out of its previous pattern of only having PR seats and winning wards. If they win wards, that's a sign of, 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 of strengthening of the EFF amongst uh, voters, very significant. So we're watching that closely. So when covering the local government elections, a couple of things perhaps that might be useful. Uh, the first one, beware of opinion polls and projections. They're invariably wrong. So Ipsos is going to start publishing polls for the, the October uh, poll uh, and uh, cover them, read them, interrogate them, critically engage them uh, and, and interrogate and compare their projections to previous uh, municipal results and see whether they make sense or not. Um, now, there are a whole range of issues there, which I'm not going to talk about now, but uh, opinion polls prior to elections globally are notoriously unreliable. Um, they're fun, and it's nice to take, to discuss them and rip them apart, but uh, in, invariably their predictions, their results are wrong. And that's because of methodological and a whole range of other challenges in how polls are done. So watch the polls. There are going to be a lot of them uh, as they were in 2016 and in 2019. It would be good to interview leaders and candidates from the smaller parties. They're really, really interesting. And this is 
maybe the the novel aspect of uh, local government elections post 2016 is the springing up of the smaller focused parties embedded in communities that reflect values, interests, concerns of the communities in which they operate. So get hold of the leaders and the candidates from these smaller parties and ask them questions and about how they operate, how they work, how they get their support, how they fund their campaigns. And you'll get some really interesting information on how parties operate in communities in terms of reflecting communities and representing uh, communities. Also get hold of candidates from all the parties and ask them tough questions about service delivery. Um, so what are you gonna do about service delivery? We know there are problems. Uh, everyone says in the past, they're gonna fix them and we still where we are. What are you gonna do different? Tough questions, uh, not sweetheart questions, tough questions. How are you gonna make service delivery happen? Challenge, uh, especially in Johannesburg, the councillors in terms of this 120 days of accelerated delivery, as I mentioned it at the beginning of my presentation, what's the politics behind that? And you can see what I'm hinting at in terms of the growth of those smaller parties uh, in those geographic areas where there's a lot of accelerated service delivery happening. But also ask the candidates, 120 days of accelerated delivery, does that mean that residents get a rebate on wards over the last four years? In other words, what have you done in the last four years? And why are you doing five years of work in 120 days? Tough questions. Um, see how the candidates respond to that. Also questions on the vision that the candidates have for their wards and the communities that they represent in council. Very important to hear about the vision because the vision is all about values. It's all about the oughts, the things that need to be done to make our communities better, safer, cleaner, healthier. So vision questions are always really, really nicely. Uh, nice. And also put questions to the leaders and the, the councillors that you interview. And they'll all respond positively to requests for interviews because that's what politicians do. Ask them about coalitions, what they're going to do in co uh, coalitions. Should no individual party win a majority? Who are you going to cooperate with? Why? What are your principles? What are their principles? What are the parameters? that you can work within in terms of forming coalitions. Tough questions, good questions, questions that voters need answers for and information on to make their choices. So in conclusion, in the remaining five minutes, a couple of, of thematic uh, issues that are, 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 are useful perhaps. This is a very important local government election. It's not to say that the others aren't important that we've had in the past, but this is a really important one. Um, it's an important one in terms of uh, coalitions. Is this going to be a referendum on coalitions? Will parties vote one way or another to avoid coalitions because we've seen uh, the negative effect that coalitions have had uh, in many of the metros in service delivery. Some of the more outlying municipalities have had coalitions that have been successful, but in the metros, the coalitions haven't been successful at all. So maybe this is what this LGE is about, a referendum on coalitions. Very important. It's a major test of ANC recovery in the post Zuma era. Will the turnout for the ANC be significantly higher, the same, or maybe lower in terms of wards, in terms of PR allocation? Because this will give us a sense 
of whether the rejuvenation of the ANC, as it keeps on talking about in its post-NEC statements, is working or not. This is, is, is an acid test for all of that. So it's really, really important to, to watch these uh, elections closely. Similarly, it's a test of the new leadership in the DA. Can they hold on to their white urban voting base? Can they win back some of the Afrikaner voters that they've lost? Can they win back uh, communities, Lanasia uh, and El Dorado Park in particular, to bolster their representation in council? So the, the, the DAs uh, got a, a lot of challenges going into this LGE, and we, we wait to see how they deal with them, how they campaign, and what the results are. As I've said before, it's a test of EFF traction in terms of winning wards. Can they show that they've got co concentrated support in demarcated geographic areas in terms of wards? That will be an indicator of, of EFF traction. Uh, we wait to see what the signs are uh, in, in parts of Northwest, parts of KZN, and parts of, of Johannesburg, there's reason for optimism, but um, we, we only know the results at the end. We also need to take into account fragmentation of parties and the formation of smaller parties. Really important in terms of coalition making, should there not be a majority party in council after the election. These smaller parties, are going to assume a role far in excess of the numbers of voters that they have behind them. Because when you need it to form a coalition, you have bargaining power. And that's what we mean by queen makers. You get more than what you should have in terms of your voting support in order to bring you into a coalition and you influence the manifesto of the coalition government beyond your electoral mandate. Very, very significant. Maybe some of the major issues uh, to come out of this local government election is that they are really, really a test of public trust in elections, a test of public trust in parties, and most importantly, a test of public trust in politicians. At national and provincial level, what we've seen is a 7% decline in turnout between 2014 and 2019. In other words, the number of citizens coming out to vote then, two years ago, declined by 7%. That's a big number of votes. Is a similar number going to occur in these elections compared to turnout in 2016? I think the national average was 58%. Um, so if it declines by 7%, that means turnout is 51%. 51% of registered voters, excluding unregistered eligible voters, voted. That tells you that uh, people don't have faith in democratic structures to represent their interests. So we really need to keep an eye out for that decline in turnout. And then finally, the point I wish to make is about these elections are all about accountability. Uh, elected councillors, whether from the wards, from the parties, or from the independents, will be structured in council in terms of Section 79 committees. So you will have a roads committee, a water committee, uh, a, a street lighting committee, electricity committee, etc. And you'll have elected councillors on those committees performing oversight functions over the departments that have to fix the potholes, that have to fix the lampposts, that have to make sure the water that comes through the taps is uh, clean, potable and safe. So those councillors that are elected have a, a really crucial role to make sure that uh, administrators and the people on the ground who do the work 
do they work properly? And that's why we need strong mandates, strong accountability in terms of uh, the elected representatives performing those accountability functions. And most importantly, watch impact municipal public accounts committees, elected councillors sitting on this very important committee, which oversees financial management in municipalities. So you look at Auditor General's reports on municipalities and you just see a train smash, one after the other, with very few exceptions. What are impacts in all the municipalities doing to ensure better, if not effective, financial management of the resources that municipalities have? So let me stop here. <coughs> And then we can take uh, some rounds of questions uh, in terms of the two presentations and then move towards conclusion thereafter. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I hope that this has been useful. So uh, TK, let me hand over to you so you can chair from now on. All right, then, uh, thanks, Enpro. Okay, uh, I think uh, if there are any questions, I think uh, now's the time to test uh, for, I think, where we get your feedback. And I think what also would be good is just to get your assessment over the years as, as media practitioners, how you've covered, how you've covered it and what you find found to probably be the most problematic issue around covering local government. I think that would also be good. So it's always like a two way conversation, if that's fine. So I'm just looking to see if uh, I'm also, all right. Uh, manana Manana, Prof has a question for you. May you kindly expand on why the 2021 local government elections are important? Um, I partly uh, answered that. Um, it's a, I think if, if I'm to cut through all the, the detail and all the the, 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 the information that I spoke about, uh, I think it's a test of public trust. I think it, it really does come down to all of this. Will people come and vote, those who registered? Will uh, the IEC's uh, voter registration campaigns bring more people onto the voters role? And will they participate in this election? And if we see low registrations, low turnouts, that is a powerful indicator of a, a, a decrease in public trust in politicians and democratic processes. And if that's the case, uh, it's, it's very significant. And uh, we've been through a whole range of turbulent political events over the last 10 years. And we want to see whether uh, it's had a positive or a negative impact on the voting community. Uh, 2019, 7% decline, is there going to be a decline now or will there be a pickup based on more recent uh, developments? I, I would argue that that is for me the key aspect of, of this uh, local government election. So I hope that that helps. Okay, I think there's a very interesting question from uh, Lizelle Pretorius, a freelance journalist who runs a project called Track My Mayor. Uh, Lizelle, please could you maybe also just uh, get in touch with us because I think that would be very interesting just to hear what you're doing. But she says, uh, thank you for the useful workshop. What is your advice to a national publication for dealing with the scale of local government when making coverage, coverage decisions? And I think she's saying, remembering that there's 250 municipalities plus uh, countless wards. TK, do you want to take that one? It fits in with okay. the, the content of your presentation. All right. No, uh, uh, is that, the way I view it, oh, I think it's a, it's a hard one, but I think, look, uh, I think you have to pick, I think you cannot say, you cannot pick everything, but uh, the way I view it, look, is, hmm, let me actually think, because I, it's such a good question, because it really is about what goes up, what goes down. The, the way I view it, and this is just my, my preference, is, look, I think you can't ignore the metros, where, for better or worse, the, the metros are where the economy is happening at the moment. But I think 
there also has to be, I think in research, uh, we call it sampling, if I'm not mistaken, Prof will correct me. It's the issue of sampling where I think you have to have an, you can't have an equal proportion of all municipalities, but I think there has to be an element of what's termed rural municipalities and those that are closer to the township. So look, I would probably take about what, if there's about six, six metros, if I'm not mistaken, I can stand to be corrected. But I think even in alongside that, you then you have to have a dedicated probably four or five rural municipalities spread across the country. And then just your normal, just your municipalities, which are probably in towns, like your Bethlehem type of places. Because what, what this does then, I think it, you're then able to give a richer picture of, because sometimes when we say South Africa, what we really mean is, no, we mean Joburg, we mean Pretoria, and we mean Cape Town or Durban, or sometimes Buffalo City. So I think obviously you have to take care of that. But I think if you were to really purposely say, listen, we can't cover everything, but we are going to, try and make an effort to make sure that, listen, at least in a week, let's try to cover 10, maybe to 20, maybe I'm stretching it a bit, 10 to 20 municipalities that have got a rural dimension. And you'd understand rural dimensions in South Africa are very, are very different. What happens in Mahikeng? I know people from Mahikeng won't like me called rural, but what happens in rural Mahikeng and what happens in Tata are two totally different things. So the way I'd put it is that as long as you can say, listen, did I represent, you know, the urban, Perry urban rural divide well and well again it has to be I guess you're going to have to make a judgment call as well but I think what would be important is that as long as you show that there is more to South Africa than the predominant metros and I think you go deeply into it because I think that's sometimes what's missing is that we don't go deep enough to understand what's actually happening in rural South Africa so I think if you could do that for me I think that that's possibly maybe the best way to do it uh, you let me know if I've answered your question or if I've just maybe dodged around it like some of the politicians you probably cover uh, El Bontong, I think from part of me, me Let me add a little bit on to what, what you've said, TK. Go for it, bro. Maybe to, to organize your coverage thematically. So uh, one, one coverage area coalitions. Look at the ones that have worked, which are the more rural coalitions. Why have they worked? Is there a rural dimension that enables coalitions versus uh, the urban metros? where coalitions haven't worked well. So try and organize uh, that uh, thematically. Look at Auditor General reports. Identify municipalities with clean about. audits. Compare them to municipalities uh, with samples where there have been very bad audits. And try and establish what the reasons are for the one and the other so that you can bring in uh, the, the the various perspectives and as 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 my colleague TK said, the rural urban is absolutely important here. Very different challenges, similar processes, and compare and contrast the urban rural in terms of what LED means in a urban context and what LED means in a rural context. Really nice ways of thematically organizing the the the, the coverage. So so that's my ten cents worth. Thanks, Prof. I think there's a very interesting, like, actual case study here from uh, Erlen Ontong Pal. It says, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm running a local community radio station in Pal. We're currently running a program for, for the second week in a row on public participation on IDP reviews and putting it under the spotlight. Last week, we invited the local municipality to join the conversation and, and they declined. We again invited them again for tonight's show and again, they declined and invite. How do we as community keep local municipality, especially the political oversight, uh, pol uh, political oversight accountability? They decline in both invites because they do not want community engagement during programs. Now, that's, I think that this is why, as I was saying, when, if we could also start, like I said, I like the angle you're taking uh, when you, because you're very direct, because you can't really, this is one of those things you can't get around. Communities know how they live. So I think it, it, for me, it's not a surprise that they are dodging, but maybe to answer your question more directly. And look, as I said, I'm not a media practitioner, so you excuse me if I'm probably mixing up my, my wires. But I think this is where maybe national syndications or national publications and stations also have to come to the help of smaller radio community stations. Because the reason I think why they probably know that, listen, they can get away with this it is because I think they believe that there won't be a backlash. I think the work you're doing and continuously putting them on the spotlight is the correct thing to do. But I think there needs to sometimes be a synergy between saying, okay, listen, 
this is how Impala have been doing it. We've been doing it, but they also need champions in the in national syndications and I think syndication in terms of radio stations, because I think this should be taken up as an issue by, you know, by a larger publication. So say, but listen, and I think the way I do it is to say, listen, maybe ask your your, your fellow colleagues who are at a national level to actually say, listen, but listen, uh, ANC or a DA. Listen, when one of our sister stations and Paul actually invited your people to come through, they didn't do that. Why is it that you keep speaking about public participation at local government level, but when local government radio stations like the ones in Paul are asking you, the people you put up as representatives to come to us, it's not happening. Because I think it, it works best if there's a, almost like a cascading effect of pressure where you put pressure on the national so that they can make the local account. Now, I, I'm assuming that's it's probably being done in a lot of different ways and maybe this has been done or it's not been done. But I, for me, just from where I'm sitting and not being in the media fraternity, I think that's just the best way to do it is to really use the forces to really cascade the effect down because this is, I think it's really a bit symbolic and it's also a bit unethical for you to want our votes. But when we have to come account, you'll find many different reasons to to, to obfuscate your responsibility. So Earl, I'd say continue the good job, but maybe it's time to maybe try find linkages with your national syndications and the like to really put pressure on political parties where these people are involved. Prof, any views on that? No, I think you covered that one really nicely. You go to the Q, there's a Q and A function here. It's from Kamukhetsu Matsara. When interviewing candidates in elections, especially for fast-paced reporting, how can we, as many practitioners, move away from in, from ensuring that it doesn't turn into merely a, merely a way of spin uh, to spinning in favor without needing to expand the platform to other candidates? I think that's a good one, eh? yeah, Prof. It's a lovely one, <laughs> and it's part of what I was saying earlier about asking tough questions. So when you when you interview uh, candidates in elections is to do a bit of background research to the wards that they coming from or wish to stand in and the parties and their histories. So you've got a sense of the challenges in the municipality and to ask very, very specific questions like uh, the municipality got a really poor audit from the Auditor General in the last round of audits let us help us understand what you're going to do as a member in the oversight committee and possibly a member of MPAC to ensure that the scarce resources are used better. So you don't ask vague questions about what are you going to do to represent the people? What are you going to do to make service delivery better? You ask specific, focused, detailed questions so that you can draw the, 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 the candidate out to, to get a, a clearer answer on how they understand and interpret uh, uh, their role. A really nice question to throw at councillors is, how, do, how can citizens contact you to discuss their concerns in the ward? Can you give us contact details? And a good councillor will give an email address and a phone number immediately a bad counselor might say, I'll get back to you on that one. And that gives you follow up questions. Are you scared of your constituency? <laughs> you don't want them. So straight away, you, you can start to ask subsidiary questions. But the, the key issue here is specifics, not vague, general, open ended questions, a very narrow and focused question on so that you draw the, the, the candidate out on detail. Thank you, thanks for that, Prof. All right, Sorry, you, just um, went, you just went mute for a while there. Sure, no, I'm not on mute. Um, okay, we can hear you now, Prof. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, gee, uh, what's the, the next? Uh, uh, the next one from Jacob Lamola. Uh, uh, Jacob, let me know if, I'm, if, I'm, if I've got your context correctly here. Yeah? Uh, it's how do you deal with conflict that usually takes place uh, on voting sides, where I'm just going to paraphrase how, how Jacob puts it, where, look, they, I think they being political parties will start to accuse you of taking sides, either or, 
whether you're for them or not. And that's one. And then sec- I think the last one, he says, what happens when they start, you know, start attacking you personally where you feel as though you're under threat from them uh, because they feel they, they, you have offended them? <laughs> that's a, yeah, it's a tough, well, it's a different one. Eh? It's, a, it's a crucial one. And we've seen mm. the intimidation and harassment of journalists repeatedly in the media of late. So this is a trend that is increasing. And it doesn't mean that uh, journalists uh, must uh, not be uh, probing in their questioning. It means that the probing must be done in a way that's maybe more diplomatic and, and, and less threatening to the recipient of the question. So to role play your questions with colleagues before you go out into the field uh, and get colleagues to comment on the style and the tone of the question rather than the content of the question so that you perfect the way of asking a question that's really probing, that's a tough question without coming across as adversarial. So you're trying to convey information to the public in the public interest uh, so that citizens can make choices and, and you're an enabler of the democratic process rather than a partisan actor for uh, a, a suspected A, B or C uh, party. So role playing questioning is, is quite important here. Uh, and if there's aggression from uh, the respondent, uh, my, my view would be uh, try and remove yourself from the situation as diplomatically as possible. Um, things can get quite heated. Uh, there's, there's high stakes games here in terms of careers, individual incomes, etc. So a lot of intuition, a lot of acumen, a lot of role playing to, to present the questions in a neutral pro- professional way. So that's a bit of a vague answer, but I can't think of, 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 of what else to say on that one. But just be careful and be diplomatic. And I think uh, precaution is better than anything else at the, at the moment. Uh, I think I don't see any questions, but I think I would throw questions to the back to the media fraternity. And it has to do with, I think, something we actually haven't spoken about, COVID. How do you now do your reporting in, in the era of COVID? Because, I mean, the one-on-one interviews, asking community members, and I'm now, I think, drawn to, uh, I think everybody's been following what's, what has happened in India. Now, obviously, look, India and South Africa, they're, they're the same, but they're worlds apart at the same time. And uh, I'm not sure, maybe, Prof, you picked it up in the, on the wires. I haven't. The, the big question, I, and I'll put it up front, I used to think when, when the EFF was actually saying that, listen, let's, propose, let's postpone the election, I was thinking it was politicking. But I think they were saying one of the reasons why the Modi government has really sort of messed up has been the politicking, the fact that they started to do political campaigning. And I think it's something, especially people work in the media almost, who have to go out and literally put their lives at risk a lot of times you know, it would be interesting to you, how do you now deal with this in the era of COVID? Because even going to, it's one thing to make an appointment with a politician, you can do that over the telephone or a different medium, but going into communities, you cannot account for where people are. So I'd really like to maybe hear from the media fraternity, I think even from uh, our own Vitz uh, colleagues who are in the, uh, the school of media, how, what happens? How, how do we now handle this situation? Well, if, if, if the media people are thinking about that, let me shoot my mouth off for a bit. Um, so the, the best case scenario is that most of us are vaccinated by the time October comes. <laughs> um, so, so there will be some role out there. But uh, the, the protocols in terms of uh, masks, outside events, uh, no indoor events, all events uh, to be outside. I think that that can help. And doing interviews with sufficient distance in between yourselves and uh, the candidates, I I think that that can work. Um, I'm not convinced that we need to postpone the elections. I think we need to do the campaigning differently. And what we've seen in uh, the UK 
which has just had a, a very important round of local government elections, is candidates using social media really effectively, walking through their communities, taking selfies of areas and issues and parts of the community that need attention and saying what they're going to do in terms of uh, addressing those concerns. And the most powerful selfie video that I saw was of a candidate walking through a, a park and looking at the playground equipment that was broken and was just like filming it and saying, just not good enough. What our, ch our, ch our children deserve better. And then you, you have your pages on social media and you distribute that. So I think the candidates are going to start to use social media a lot more effectively uh, in this campaign, but for journalists covering it uh, to maintain all the protocols and up, then I think it's, it's pretty safe, especially if it's outdoors. So to conduct the interviews wherever possible outdoors. What about a walk around social distance, masked, et cetera, with the candidate in the community Say, what are you gonna do about this? That street looks really bad. Look at these light posts, they're not working. What are you gonna do about it? It's a nice way to make it really grounded and concrete while safe at the same time. Well, oh, thanks for that. Um, I'm not sure how you pronounce, uh, is it you? It's you? From, I think, a uh, fellow faculty in the Witz School of Journalists, is uh, Shoshu. Sorry for putting you on the spotlight. All right, anyone else from the media fraternity who maybe wants to take a dab at this? Because I think, like I said, we're also equally learning at the same time. Uh, so we're more than also happy just to take that. Oh, hi, sorry. Are you saying, are you saying Shui Shui? I, I'm, I, might, I might be missing, is it yes. you? Yes. Oh, the way you oh. It's Shui Shui, not... No, not a problem. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I'm hoping that we can have a lot more of these conversations. But um, my question maybe more um, to Professor Iva is, um, if for us as community stations, we've traditionally covered um, elections, in fact, just as media in general, by hosting those um, town hall conversations and um, engaging people in a group environment. Now, the challenge is if we are looking at some community stations we, which are out in the rural areas, they might not be able to have the resources, for example, to, help, to hold a virtual or a Zoom interaction like this. Um, so how do we still drive participation and engagement um, while it's, it's almost impossible um, to, well, interact with people um, in one room with the fear of the dead wave, how do we, you know, what would be the best way for us to go about um, encouraging and um, engagement? Thank you. No, uh, crucial issues. Um, uh, and that's using uh, social media uh, to some extent. Uh, Voice, voice notes on WhatsApp are a nice way to have recorded conversations. You WhatsApp your question, the, the answer is WhatsApp back to you in a voice note, and then you can edit those files in terms of conveying the views in your, your broadcast. Uh, if, if people don't have data and, and, and uh, WhatsApp is, is not possible, then to, to, to use uh, voice, uh, voice, voice conversations and record the voice conversations on phone. All the phones have these apps where you can record your conversations uh, and then edit uh, appropriately and uh, broadcast the conversation with a person. And the advantage there is uh, that you will get a, a more spontaneous uh, conversation. It, it means that one would have to find sponsors perhaps for the community station to, to, to provide funding for uh, the data and for the, the, the voice costs in terms of running this on, on cell phone. If you've got landline recording equipment, that makes it a lot cheaper. But I think we're gonna to have to innovate on this one. Uh, uh, I, 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 I think that the technology is there to be used and we've got to find the best way to use it in the cheapest way possible. So that would be my, my response uh, to, to that one, uh, Shwe Shwe.
Oh, I'm just looking at it. Uh, I think Luvuya and Danny is typing up a question, so we'll just wait for them to, to, to maybe to, to sit on it. Uh, but maybe just uh, uh, also Mushesha, I think, look, a different way of also maybe doing it is, uh, I really, okay, I guess I'm only going to punt because <laughs> that's what I specialize in is, is local government. When you look at the issues of IDPs, actually going through them is, it, it's very, very telling. I think I like the idea Prof has said with where just taking in the community or I mean, just the layout of the land type of thing. And maybe well, what's missing is just uh, specific pages on, let's say, like for me, I come from the Val in, in Everton and look, those powerful pictures of seeing sewage go through people's houses and uh, the fact that the municipality is literally, it's just broken down. They, we don't have a municipality anymore. We've got a, I think they even under, beyond under, under administration, finances are coming to creditors are even taking furniture. And we actually see a whole municipality because I think I saw some local media outlet taking photos of when the creditors came to take furniture from the municipality. It, it literally brought home, we all knew it was dysfunctional, but when you see that, it's like, oh my word. So I think we just probably need to think around uh, certain things like that. Uh, let me just see if the, the new questions have come in. Okay, no, no, oh, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, Yes. Okay, uh, Jacob Lamola comes back and says, in addition, I had an interview with the IEC at the BCRM FM in terms of how they'll deal with the issue of COVID-19 pandemic. The response was not giving me 100%, <laughs> with almost certainty. Sure they're able to control or handle voters accordingly. That's actually brilliant. Because yeah, that's actually the type of information I think we as researchers also need because yeah, proper. Uh, I think you, you you read it. They're not get. They haven't got a hundred percent confidence in the IEC and what the IEC is doing in relation to COVID. Well, this is a. I think I think one of the easier ones. Um, uh, in the voting station, you you spray paint uh, markers for social distancing in the line, uh, and it's outside, so that's already much safer. The building, the windows, the doors are left open, and uh, you you advertise in advance that voters bring their own pens and pencils, so that uh, that there isn't an exchange of pencils. And if there is an exchange of pencils, that you have a box, which uh, are sanitized. So people put pencil in box A. Someone sanitizes pencils from box A, puts them in box B and people take the pencils from box B to mark their, their ballot, and that people move out of the voting station as quickly as possible. So I think that that's like going shopping. It's like standing in a till at the supermarket buying your stuff. Uh, it's, it's easily manageable uh, in, in that regard. The, the campaigning uh, and the meetings, uh, I think that's, that's the, 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 the more, more difficult, uh, uh, the more difficult challenge. It, it could even be done outdoors on a sports field at a local school under umbrellas and gazebos. Um, the IC has got gazebos and uh, you go from one gazebo to the next outdoors and the risks of, of, of running an election like that would be much, much less than if the voting stations do the process indoors. Of course, that depends whether there's going to be rain or, or, or et cetera. But uh, these are the kinds of possibilities in terms of being innovative to make sure that the elections uh, do happen. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, the Vuyom Dennis come with this question. She says, I would like to find out uh, with regards to the use of technology to, give, uh, to speak to the audience. Do we not run the risk of excluding certain communities mainly because, yeah, because of why we use data or data connectivity in South Africa? And I think that's actually a very pertinent one. And, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, well, I'm not even saying it's actually a service delivery, <laughs> but because I mean, government should have long ago dealt with this data question and the necessary infrastructure. You're right with you. It's, it's actually quite, yeah, for, I think for my end, you're right. And I think this is what makes it a bit hard to, to really, that's why I think we were really were interested in hearing how you as a media fraternity handle it because, yeah, look, I think yeah, speaking from the, 
the I don't want to say leafy suburbs. Uh, I'm in the Bundu, so yes. And then let's say those of us who are able to actually just be at this platform, it is actually a bit hard to to really think around. Um, think of communities in K, rural KZN, and you know places like uh, the Northwest. How do you reach them? And I think yeah, this is where COVID has been a tragedy. And I think this is why I think community stations become so so important. Um, speaking from experience, I think I grew up on Bolisedi FM, Bomotswedi uh, FM, and I think they. We really do need to find a way of just creating a better ecosystem where this information gets to them. Because for now, it's, a, it's just the best way. I see that there's a hand raised for a question. Uh, can, you, can you just stay to your in your question? Alfonso? I'm hello, so how are you? Oh, well, and you, sir? I'm good, thank you. Um, just. I just hope that what I'm going to say uh, makes sense enough. I'm reflecting to your presentation earlier on and reading one of um, the statements. Um, as somebody coming from the VAR and seeing how the, the reports on how the VAR have been in terms of service delivery and everything like that, it has somehow, as the photojournalist as well, it has set this agenda that, you know, um, I, I now have this um, agenda of writing in a more, uh, what can I say, uh, a, a way that's shaming or like, not even shaming, but pointing out every wrongs what the Fulani municipality has on the vow, the effects. I mean, it's, it's not visible at all. And it has impacted me as a journalist to like um, develop this certain agenda. And I don't know if it's a good thing to have this, although this is the truth and this is what's happening and I'm not filtering anything, but in regards to this, um, how do we, as a journalist, um, try not to be too personal with this story and, you know, not getting ahead of it or, yeah, getting in too personal with it, basically? Oh, yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a very good one. Hey? It's, <laughs> I think the closest equivalent I could have is, uh, I think when you're giving analysis, I don't know how Prof feels about it, the times where you feel as though because academia by its nature, we also like giving solutions and always thinking what comes next. And sometimes you get, it's like you have two or three interviews in a week and you're saying the same thing over and you feel as though, am I just hammering these people over and over and over? And you do feel as though sometimes you just want to take a break from all of it and say, listen, I'm tired. Why must I always be the guy when you see Prof Ivo, oh no, uh, government is not working. He's going to tell us, you know. Uh, but then, like you said, it's the issue of, is it the truth, you know? Because, <laughs> you know, it, it would be different if, if it was a, the, the, the counterfactual was, what you're saying is simply opinion. You can't hide that there's sewage. You can't hide that the municipality is literally falling apart. And I'm speaking to someone from the Val, I can't hide it. Every time I go home, that's what I see. So it becomes an issue of, yes, it's not nice always being the bearer of bad news, but you, if it's the truth, I don't think there's any, it would be wrong if you didn't report. Maybe, I think maybe development local journal, I think that's what they call developmental journalism would be giving the next step forward, you know? Because sometimes I think even in the media, we, uh, I'll just speak as an analyst, sometimes you get very bored of hearing the problem and people will say, but when are you always telling us the problem? Give us the solution. So I think it challenges you to be a bit nuanced in your thinking. And it also challenges you to give, give a solution. And I think maybe that's where the direction you could possibly be going by saying, yes, I've reported this is bad in the VAR, but this is a possible fix. For, for instance, I'm sure you know at the moment that we, we've just had disaster after disaster when it comes to counselors. So it'll be interesting to find out, you know, who's the new younger, if younger, not so much in age, but just younger in experience, counselors who are coming in. What, what Prof was saying, what are their ideas? You know, sometimes it's actually good to get a bit of hope to hear you know, people who have not been touched by the system to say, oh yeah, you know what? This is what I wanna do for the VAL. And this is what I'm thinking of. So maybe you could just twist it in that way by saying, not changing, you can't change negativity because I believe that's called propaganda. But what you can do is you can start to say, could I report something that could be a possible new light to the situation? Uh, as I said, I hope that sort of helps. I'm not uh, great, great at that. Uh, Prof, anything on your side on that? It's a tough one and it's a good one because um, one doesn't want to come across as negative and critical and nitpicking all the time. Uh, so 
what I sometimes try and do when I get asked to comment on events is I try and identify an area of success and then to say, but you've achieved in this area, can't you replicate the process that led to the success in area X uh, to area Y? So in a particular municipality, there must be at least one thing that's been done well and to try and establish what it is and why it was done well and what could be done following that positive experience to improve on other areas where there are major challenges. Uh, so you, you're asking the same question. You, you, you're pushing uh, people to be accountable for non-performance, but you're not coming across as nitpicking and negative all the time. So it's part of the diplomacy and the role play in terms of how you present uh, questions to the people that you you speak to, um, to draw them out in as positive a way as, as possible. Uh, so these are the, some of the, 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 the kinds of, 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 of things that, that might work. Uh, that's just my two cents worth. All right, I uh, see probably this probably be the last two questions. Uh, I'll take the first one, Prof, which is from Jonathan Ramutza, and then you'll take the second one from Candy's brain, which I think you'll probably enjoy a bit. Uh, Jonathan asks, do you think local government is assisting in making coverage by community media simple, or would they rather give attention to coverage by national publications? Uh, look, I think it does, it does help them. In a way, look, it, it, it's nice and easy to, to be shielded by radical economic transformation, new dawn, compens land without compensation. I don't know what the dear Prof. Soma Dr. Fikeni always says, the party that is self-mutilating in a corner. It's easy, look, to, to, to just put that out there because I think that has become so much part of our narrative that, look, even, I'm, I'm not sure how Prof does it, even when we get invited to, to media spaces, you know, it sometimes surprises people that people ask you the big ANC question, the big DA, the big EFF question, but they won't ask you about what's happening in your community. And I think it, it is a mind shift, which I think we we dramatically need to do. Uh, look, I'm, I'll, I'll use a, a very bizarre, a bizarre example, which is not democratic. That if you look at how the Chinese do local, I believe it or not, the Chinese do vote. It might not be in the same world in the same way we do it but they're very involved in local government in China, where you have to, where it's upon the municipality and, look, and those authorities need to know what's happening in the community. And a lot of the media, obviously because of restrictions, tend not to focus what happens with the big party at the top in Beijing. So they focus a lot of attention on what's happening at the ground and what they've tended to find in those areas. And I also think it happens in other, maybe more mature democracies is National government finds it an embarrassment that little gov little brother is embarrassing us. And then they start to put a bit of heat on them. So I think it's, we really need a mind shift set where I think the, the national media syndicates also need to bring this home to say, listen, let's actually focus on what's happening in wards, what's happening with the, with the mayors. Let's actually know, because I think it's, it's weird that we know the composition of members of parliament, the executive ministers and the like, but we don't know the composition of, as Prof said, of what our executive mayor or what our executive mayor looks like. We don't know who's the MMC for X and Y. We always hear this word MMC. And I know it's not for every municipality, it's more for your for, for your metros. But I think we, we need to really do, do that thing. One of the things I'm 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 very I like, and I think we probably need to develop it more. I think uh, Lizelle probably, Pretorius probably put it is to say in your new, in your publications, whether radio community, why don't you have a, a quarterly score? To say this is our mayor, this is our this is our representative for infrastructure, and every quarter you give them a score. Uh, one thing I do know, and Prof, uh, Prof sort of hinted at it, and it's but he hinted at it in a different way to say when political parties hear score, for some reason their ears speculate because if you get three out of ten, whether they understand what the three out of ten represents or not, they have this need to say, but no, no, it's it's actually six, it's actually seven. So I think we just need to develop new and nuanced ways. Hence I said, look, the Viz School of Governance is always open to saying, how can we, working with the media, develop new, especially community radio stations and community entities, develop new ways to actually put pressure 
on systems of governance. That's what Prof specializes in, is a specialist in governance. And for some re weird reason, numbers and polls always get the attention of, uh, of, of, of political parties. I'm not sure if you have anything to add there, Prof, or you want to go to your question? No, you hit the nail on the head. It's a good day from uh, Candice Grain in Paul, Voter Education. Will there be a point that these conversations and topics of democracy will be introduced to children at school level? Perhaps starting this conversation at an early age, or is there an age limit? As I said, you like this one, Prof. No, it's a, <laughs> it's a fundamentally important question. And it's supposed to be covered in the subject called life orientation, where <clears throat> some of the topics are civic education, the constitution, democracy, participation, uh, etc. cetera. It, it happens in high school. It doesn't happen enough, early enough. And I agree, I think we need to, to take learners from primary school right through to high school, take them through basic uh, uh, lessons with assignments, uh, with, with, with tasks where you can interview your parents and grandparents and family on what it felt like to vote. Uh, and that could be mm. part of a history assignment uh, so that uh, learners get a good sense early on before they can vote what voting is and how people in the community and close to them perceive it. And that's how you build a respect for a consolidation of democratic practice. Um, and I don't think we are doing enough of that uh, in South Africa. Uh, uh, many countries don't do enough of it. Democracies once every five years. Uh, and, and I agree, it's not enough. And I think the curriculum does need to, to be changed to give more emphasis uh, to this right through schooling. Uh, every year, some form of project uh, in terms of how your local government's functioning, who's your provincial legislature member, uh, what have they done for you, so that we can start to build a culture of accountability where citizens hold elected reps accountable, because without that, you don't have democracy. So yes, uh, uh, crucial. No, thanks for that, for the prof. Uh, this I take it will be the last question from uh, Osma Shreve. Uh, how do we, how do we, the voice of it, targeting young people, encourage the youth to participate in voting? Is that our role to play as the media, or not? Uh, I think we'll, pro we'll probably both answer this, uh, prof, and that will, and then we'll just lead to your your closing statements. I'll, I'll answer it and I'll put my closing statements, and then you'll just close us off. Yeah, it's a whew. look. Yeah, it's a, it's a you know the youth are very. I guess maybe I don't I don't qualify as youth anymore. I saw gray hairs this morning, so I I, I can't I guess I can't answer for them. But look, I, I think it. There's nothing wrong with encouraging voting. I think where it becomes a problem is if people sense you're making, you're telling them who to vote for. Yeah. So I think that, that that is not really that that's not the issue. And look, if we look, if we look at our our situation, I think how the year began with the whole uh, the fees, uh, the continuation of fees must fall. Uh, you know the whether you like him or not, the previous VC, I think in his last statement, though, I think was on. Newsroom Africa he said something very pertinent, which I, I don't think it's actually highlighted enough. He says, you know, it's very, and I'm paraphrasing, and he'll, if I'm wrong, uh, please don't, don't sue me. Uh, he, he said, it's actually, it was actually very weird to participate and be part of those processes because, on one hand, yes, you sit with people from these political parties who, previous to meeting with you five minutes, have had discussions and talks with their national mother bodies. And one of these political parties happens to be the governing party. Then they come and bring all these problems to you, which it's it's true. It's something Vitz had to look at, but it was what do you expect me to do when we all get our source from one thing, namely gov, namely the national government. And it was a smart way of basically saying, listen, it's it, South Africa, and I always make this critique that we're a nation that's very good with reactions. Proactive for some reason, being proactive 
doesn't go hand in hand in South Africa. And I know there's always this belief that, no, the youth are going to be very different in South Africa because they've got all these new toys and they can do, it's no, it's actually, they're no better than the previous probably generations or the, the generations after when it comes to the understanding of democracy. And sometimes I feel maybe the best way, and I, and I think maybe when you experiment in class is to actually prick, to prick the, the egos a bit. That's how I find it. You, I normally put up a major issue uh, such as, you know, whether it was e-tolls or whether it was even this whole issue of fees must fall. And then I asked them, okay, look, you might not be government, but when was the last time you actually said, listen, I'm, if I'm an ANC member or if I'm an EFF member, you actually made a concerted effort to get hold of your member of parliament and say, but listen, you actually supposed to be representing me when they're doing these votes at national government, what are you exactly doing? You know, so I think sometimes the best way is, it's almost to play the, I think it's called the, devil's advocate, where you actually prick them to say, but listen, it's not good enough to tweet, you know, to say, here I am tweeting, this is a problem, but what are you proactively doing? Because the sad thing about democracy is it, it, it's, it's a bit like a car. <laughs> if you don't put in the fuel, which is your energy, and it might just be you sometimes in the room, it's not gonna get anywhere. And I think maybe that's the message that needs to be communicated to the youth, because oftentimes, I find that the message which comes from the media about the youth is to glamorize them, that there's this new, jo there's this new Joseph generation that is going to save us because they've got all the answers. When in actual fact, most of them actually don't have the answers and they're like you and I, just simply trying to say, where should I go to the answers? So I think we need to give them the different avenues of the technical side. This is, this is your member of parliament. This is how you approach them as prophet saying, this is what you look out for if they're not being responsive. And then start to say, okay, now that you found the problem, this is now where you can use your, you know, your, your youthfulness, your energy, your imagination to say, how do you get rid of this problem? Because I find that the, the, this thing of us always picketing and, and writing at the last minute, it's good, it does its point, but it's almost like a counter cycle that we keep doing this so often. I think Napoleon once said that you should be very careful when uh, fighting your enemy, that you do not always use the same strategy or else they tend to read you. So I think that's where we are at the moment. I know it's not an answer, it was a bit too philosophical, but I think the point is to say, we need to really put the onus on the youth to say, listen, because when I lived in Australia, one thing I loved about Australia was when you're complaining, complaining, the Australians would always ask, did you vote? If your answer was no, they say, shut up. You've got no part in this. And I, I'd love for us to get to a point where we can simply say to someone who's young, who's complaining, did you vote? And if the answer is no, to say, just shut up. You're part of the problem. You're not helping us. Yeah. Don't quote me on that. Bye bye. <laughs> so I think thank you for the for the conversation. As I said, I, I learned equally, especially about the challenges you face uh, because of COVID, and also unresponsive government authorities. On my end, I think we were. I'm always committed to just having a conversation to help where I can with regards to anything with, with the IDPs and LEDs. Uh, my email address is there. My contacts have been put there. Please do feel free to reach out. And yeah, I think we can only just, I always believe once South Africa has healthy and better communities, we'll eventually have a better country. So my, and thank you for, for hosting us to so people like Lorato, Osmo Shefru, and thanks again to Prof Ivo as well for just uh, gracing us with your knowledge there. And Prof, yeah, you can answer that question and then you can just close off for us. Thanks, TK. And uh, your answer was spot on, I think. I can't add too much on that. Uh, encourage uh, young people to vote. Don't tell them who to vote for. Um, we know that young people think that institutional politics is less important than direct action and politics, but uh, not to discourage them from doing that either. Uh, a democracy is people make choices and they're free to make choices uh, to bear in mind that voting does make a difference and to show how participating in an election can make a difference uh, and uh, that's why it's important to at least register because if you don't register you can't vote so maybe the 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 the, the, the two messages there register and then if you registered vote because your vote can make a difference and uh, your your anecdote about australia is absolutely spot on if you did you vote yes no if the answer is no well why are you complaining <laughs> you had the opportunity yeah. to influence things you chose not to uh, the conversation moves on so 
yes, uh, try get as many people into the system as possible. That's how democracies become successful and that's how they consolidate. So that's all I wish to say about that question, which leads me to the conclusion. Thanks, uh, Kajiso. Thanks, TK, for your time in contributing to the webinar. Thanks to the team, Levato, Kamantha, fantastic work that you guys do in running these webinars, setting them up, publicizing them. And most importantly, uh, thanks to all the participants. Uh, we hope we've helped. We've hoped we've conveyed information. We've hope, we hope we've cl clarified how these elections work and why they're important. And we hope that it informs your coverage and that you produce really good journalistic stories on the forthcoming LEGs. That's what this is all about. I've put my email address in the chat. Feel free to send me an email if there's anything you wish to discuss further after this. Uh, and with that, uh, we conclude. Uh, stay safe, stay well, look after yourselves. We're in the third wave, be very careful. And all the very best to you in your studies, in your professional writing, in the management of your various journalistic uh, processes. I always love reading your all stories, except for the ones very far away. I've seen your work in print or online and uh, you all doing fantastic work in publicizing key stories in the South African meta story. Keep on doing that. Uh, you are the lifeblood of our democracy. So with that, uh, thanks to all again and uh, goodbye from us at WSG.